Yes, I got permission from my wife to do this. She did a list about her favorite crushes. I could do one of mine. Though mine's going to be more about women, because hers was more about guys, after all. I like big girls, itty bitty girls, really silly girls, golden grady girls. I like classy gals with the nice threads. I like the beast girls without a regret. I like the teen mobs and the old friends. I like the battle queens and the dull sets. I like the blessed girls and the mess girls. Not a just girls, you're the best girls. The old saying goes that music is the language of love. Right next to chocolate and knowing when to say, honey, I'm wrong. Anyways, what better lovely lady to prove the old saying true than the maven of the strings herself, Sona from League of Legends. Once upon a time, I mentioned how she was one of my favorite musician fighters, and that still holds true to this day. Her control of her sound and music itself, using it both as a weapon against her enemies and a tool to aid her allies, all made possible by striking the chords of her weapon, the Etwal. Gesundheit. And with such enchanting power over sound, surely she's got enchanting looks and a personality to match. Check and check. Her regular outfit is elegant, and her alternate skins all represent a different style of music, which I freaking love. Huh, so she does a DJ gig on Thursday nights. No, oh, no. And as for her figure, well, uh, She's got huge tracks of land. I am what I am, and that's all that I am. Also, I really love her voice. It's really gentle. Yeah, I, I know she's mute, but that- What do you mean her inner monologues don't count? Oh, really? Well, if inner monologues don't count, then how do we get gems like this? A crown guard and a mage wouldn't want to be her. Silas, he hasn't changed, and my answer is still no. Good. Mages have enough problems without you, Silas. Watch out for the quiet ones. Yeah, for someone who never outwardly communicates, her inner monologues can be pretty savage. I like me a sassy lady. Admittedly, the only reason she's at the bottom is that I just like the preceding ladies a little better. But that does little to discredit a musically gifted, secretly scathing fair lady. I love the kind of woman that can kick my ass. Like what I like, how can I not use that one? Anyways, Zarya rocks. Whether it's Overwatch or Heroes of the Storm, she's wonderful. Right off the bat, she just oozes confidence. I won't lie, I'm insecure. So the thought of having a big buff lady to watch over me and tell me it'll all be okay is kind of an inviting fantasy. We will crush them. No matter the game, Zarya is an absolute beast to play as or against. As a tank, she excels in shielding both herself and her allies. This extends into her offensive potential, where her particle cannon gets more powerful the more she absorbs with her shield. This leads to some pretty fun risk versus reward gameplay as you have to balance both your offensive and defensive abilities. Fun to play as, beautiful to look at, great balance between offense and defense, what's not to love? And that's what I would have said if I could enjoy either of those two games without a guilty conscience. How dare you take away from me, from me, scumbags! <laughs> Alright, considering this is a personal list and I'm talking about Fire Emblem, you might think I'm gonna go with the post-awakening titles and not be held hostage by my writers to talk more about the older games. Well, you might be surprised. Now yes, there are some amazing fleshed out female characters in current gen Fire Emblem, but for me, they don't hold a candle to the greatest paladin in all of Tellius, Titania. If there's one word I can best describe Titania, it's modest. Her design looks really good with her tall stature and sleek armor coupled with long radiant red hair. Just wow, she looks really gorgeous and doesn't even have to flaunt it. Take notes, Camilla. And believe me, she is just as bad as she looks. In Path of Radiance, she plays the role of an early game MVP and still managed to stay viable late game, even if outclassed in some areas. She's about as ideal as you can get being a Jagan archetype that doesn't suck, while also not being too strong that she overshadows everyone else. Well, that is until Radiant Dawn, where she's one of the best units in the game, having improved bases and growths on top of a promotion to add to her already monstrous reputation. 
Titania's character isn't as complex as the later entries, but she's still very likable. She's essentially team mom of the Grail mercenaries, keeping the boys well-trained under her upbeat yet stern supervision. Heck, she even does the accounting for the group. Hey, boys, why don't you better be massaging your shoulders? She also holds a deep gratitude for Grail, leaving behind her days as a Knight of Crimea to live with him so she can train with him and become stronger. His death really took a toll on her and is one of the few instances she seemed truly vulnerable. Am I the only one that thinks that she should have gotten a go at the Black Knight? Their fight would have been really cool and kind of hot. Titania is just great wife material in general. She's cool, strong, has the swagger of a top tier unit, and is wholesome where it counts. Even if other Fire Emblem ladies have more depth to them given their various supports, sometimes the quaint ones are all it takes to win my heart. With commanders like her, it's not surprised Grail's team would dominate Tellius for as much as they do. You've just fallen into the underworld, and you're lost, frightened, and alone. But then, a friendly, comforting face is there to help you gather your bearings, and then it tries to kill you. But then you're saved by... <laughs> yes, it's Goat Mom herself, Toriel. Caretaker of the ruins, mother of the late Azrael, wife of Asgore, and the first actual kind face we meet in the underground. The minute she sees you in trouble, she blasts Flowey with her fire powers, really a goat after my own heart, and wastes no time helping you to safety, giving you a tutorial through the catacombs. She even invites you into her home. Heck, she offers to bake for you. I have no idea what butterscotch cinnamon pie actually tastes like, but now I really want to find out. Ah, shoot! After a while, you really don't want to leave, but dang it, you need answers. She'll do what she can to prevent you from leaving, but can you blame her? She's lost her only child, her relationship with her husband is on the rocks, and now the newest light in her life wants to leave. It's heartbreaking, but she knows she has to let you go, so she gives you one last heartfelt embrace before seeing you off. Unless you want to go the genocidal route and turn her into an Icelandic dinner. <laughs> you jerk. I know when it comes to attractiveness in Undertale, several eyes probably point towards Metaton or Sans. But one should never overlook the beauty of Goat Mama. Her caring energy is so endearing and comforting and how she supports you and wants to protect you. She loves to cook, not unlike Ari, and again, fire powers! All wrapped up in a comforting figure that you just want to wrap your arms around and look to for protection. Trust me, all that adds up nicely to the goat of all goats. I gave my team a raise after that joke. Okay, this is a Final Fantasy character, and it's one you're probably thinking of, but it's not for the reasons you think. Stop it! Stop it! Despite my it's fine reaction to Final Fantasy VII, I still love a lot of the characters and moments within it. You can especially thank Final Fantasy VII Remake for this, for taking the pre-existing characters and fleshing them out even more to make them truly alive in the world they live in. This, of course, includes everyone's favorite Final Fantasy waifu, Tifa. Now let's get the obvious thing out of the way. The one thing I like about her appearance the most are those piercing circular orbs. Yep, those beautiful crimson eyes. Get your minds out of the gutter, people. You know damn well you weren't looking at her eyes. I think you guys know by now there is more to Tifa than those. While more people ship Aerith with Cloud, I can't help be a sucker for the childhood friend romance trope. I know, IRL, it isn't as common or realistic, but honestly, it warms my heart to see two people who grow up together become something more. The feelings and hardships that people go through as they become adults are difficult, and having someone who knows you so well go through it with you and see that develop into a relationship really hits me hard in the feels. And that's what Cloud and Tifa really go through. In Chapter 3 of Final Fantasy VII Remake, you see these two go through the paces, Cloud learning how to work as a merc, Tifa teaching him the rules of the slums, and it all culminates in a sweet moment between the two that adds the exact amount of backstory and connection the two of them would need at this time in the story. I think the one thing I love the most about her is that while they portray her as a character who has weaknesses and doubts about the whole eco-terrorism elephant in the room, she still kicks major butt! Tifa still rolls with the punches and kicks the crap out of anyone who gets in her way. She was one of my favorite characters to play in the remake just due to the sheer beatdown she can bring to enemies. While a lot of people see her one way, 
I see her as a caring childhood friend who has your back and will kick the butt out of anyone who threatens the both of you. Cloud and Tifa, Final Fantasy's true power couple. And Cloud, hey, if you want Aerith, I can take Tifa for you. Speaking of tomboys, I have unhealthy parasocial crushes on. Let's talk about Super Mario. Yeah, Mario isn't the first series you'd think of for me to have a crush on a character. Yeah, I guess most people did grow up on it and saw Princess Peach in a new light, or Rosalina. But you can say the same thing for any other kid-friendly game series from the 90s that have a lot of female characters. Hi, Pokemon. And I did mention Tomboys earlier, so I think you can guess I have a dear crush on my beloved Daisy. Oh, yeah! So why do I like Daisy over our normal damsel in success, or the more popular, mysterious Rosalina? Well, it honestly comes down to personality. Sure, Peach has her own tomboy qualities, but she still acts the graceful princess role for the most part. Rosalina has that nice hair, voice, and gracefulness, but... I don't know, her personality isn't grabbing me. Daisy, on the other hand, has had the reputation of being overexcited and rambunctious from the get-go. Peach is the type of character who will blush and be excited over getting flowers and chocolate. Daisy is the type of girl who will be happy with food in general. Here, this will help my point. Yes! Fries and chicken bucket! I fucking love you! Yep, Daisy is the type of girl who will eat the bucket and give you attention for the rest of the night just out of sheer happiness. And what can I say? I'm into that tomboy aesthetic. Helps that unlike Miss Toadstool, she can kick butt when needed. Heck, Peach learned how to fight and she still gets kidnapped. Daisy got kidnapped once by an alien and hasn't since. Just been playing sports and party games with the bros ever since. What you doing, Peach? Is your courage in another castle too? She's gonna be kidnapped in the movie too, despite the girl bossing, isn't she? I'll admit there isn't much to say about Daisy since she's a Mario character sidelined to the spin-off games. What we do get, though, is all I need to say how I feel about Daisy. And Luigi can have someone else. How about Rosalina? No, I'm not buying into the game theory that she's Luigi and Peach's daughter. Take that somewhere else. But hey, that's just a- After all the Soulsborne games and other games that base themselves on Greek mythology, it was so refreshing to see a roguelike that takes a lesser story of Greek faith and flesh it out this much in a super heartwarming adventure with fantastic music and gameplay to boot. As no wonder we got a really hyped sequel on the horizon. Now, I definitely have a Hades crush like a good number of you do, but it may not be what you guys think. Oh, you think, excuse me, by the way, he's gotta go. I mean, I gotta go. I mean, you know what I mean. Old school Castlevania fans must be giving me death glares for even thinking about having a thing for a Medusa head, but God, Medusa is just so adorable! Out of all the characters, she seems the one to be the most shafted by other characters, and because of that, the relationship between her and Zagria seems more genuine. After all, this all started when Zag was fired from multiple departments, so she knows how it feels to be the bottom rung of the ladder. But Dusa doesn't deserve to be! She is so hardworking and earnest that it boggles my mind when people like Nyx just don't give her more credit. Especially when lazy bums like Hypnos exist. It takes Zagreus standing up for her to Nyx that she finally gets the respect she deserves. With such a strong friendship between the two, you'd think you'd be able to come closer like you can with Thanatos and Meg. But when you finally had the chance to bring her to your room and confess, she... She friendzones you. I'm upset. Considering we have the option to romance the other two, you'd think you could romance this as well, but no. So, in a weird way, it's kind of refreshing to see not only that Dusa doesn't feel the same way, but Zag goes along with it and has no problem staying friends. Not to go full girl power, but it's surprising to have two people who could be friends and not have a romance option in a game despite having dating sim mechanics. It's different. On the other hand, come on, Dusa, I just want to show you my love! Oh gosh, I am such a simp. I am in love with you! Regardless of our relationship, I can't help but love the adorable Gorgon head. And if she isn't in Hades 2, I will riot. Now that Scarlet and Violet are being labeled as the worst Pokemon has ever been, and the previous generation wasn't actually that bad, I can finally talk about Sword and Shield without fear of a flame war. Anyways, Gen 8 really upped the hotness of the human characters. Not that anyone was complaining. 
We haven't had a real knockout since Cynthia. Among the many standout examples, we have Melanie. Let's get the office thing out of the way. This girl be thick. Seriously, she's basically a Frostmoth Kajinka. In fact, her original name in Japanese was Melon. Oh, that's accidental. They knew what they were doing. And then you get to her voice in Masters. It's chilly at night, love. Be sure to bundle up when you sleep so you don't catch a cold. Good night, everybody. In terms of her personality, she has this subtle yet threatening energy that's kind of hot. She's equally capable of being a stern teacher as well as the sweetest mama bear you will ever meet. Also, the conflict she has with her son is pretty interesting. They had a falling out years ago due to a disagreement on what kind of Pokemon Gordy should train as a gym leader. Now they have a friendly rivalry, though she still treats him like her little baby sometimes to get under his skin. <laughs> it's funny to me, but realistic. Parents and kids don't have to have the same interests. But if our kids don't like video games, we're gonna have a problem. I don't like sports ball. Fantastical elements aside, that human element of loving something no one else does I can relate to that. Well, hey, maybe now people will stop thirsting over Pokemon instead of humans. <laughs> <laughs> right. I forgot. Much like Aramau's crushes list, my number two is the character I feel is the closest to my significant other. So we got someone who's intelligent, feisty, Fiercely loyal, a strong moral code, enjoys musical theater, organized, funny, and has a healthy respect for psychology. I'm actually really curious if someone will make a shit fic between Alistair and Athena Sykes now. I don't think it surprised anyone that Athena would be here, let alone this high. I've talked at length in favorite characters and healers about how awesome she is. An attorney with a talent in psychology who proved to be a great asset to the courts, and she definitely has the personality to back it up. She's a great combination of book smart and witty while also having a real soft side. Despite that, she doesn't always chew the scenery and can be insightful and mature when the situation calls for it. She really is a ray of sunshine who breathes new life into Wright's attorney agency and is a constant thrill to sit through. She plays off of Phoenix as a strong-minded and curious student and compliments Apollo as a friend of various antics and trials. Also, she really, really likes to flex her multilingual skills, which, not gonna lie, is something I find pretty hot. Gotta get those overseas student brownie points wherever she can. Of course, I'd be remiss if I don't mention how she tends to get a bad rep within the community. Not only did the devs sideline her after her big arc was over in Dual Destinies, but even today, fans still find a reason to say she's unnecessarily shoehorned into the series and tries so hard to get attention. Even calling her a Mary Sue. Like, really? Don't get me wrong, I could see how people would say that based on a few telltale songs, but that's discrediting the legitimate nuances in her personality and how far she develops as someone who suffers a brutal trauma. She's not just a static stand-in made to get a quick appeal. She has so much more to offer as a growing character who plays into the themes of law and psychology within the series. Believe me, there are much, much worse characters out there who actually deserve to be addressed with that degrading term. But Athena is not one of them. And you know what? If the MLP Phoenix Wright crossover can see that and do her every justice she needs, I'm sure there's hope to see better appreciation for her in the future. So other than the song at the beginning, you probably noticed a pattern with my choices here. I like ladies that can do a bit of both, be kind, sweet, and gentle most of the time, but can also throw down, whether in words or in combat, and it doesn't feel like they're different people when they do. While I do like all ends of the tough, gentle spectrum, I tend to err more on the gentle. I also like people who seem to have that familiarity about them, the Storgi before the Eros. With that said, my number one is... A fish. A fish. A fishy. Ooh. No, you're not hearing that wrong. My number one video game crush is basically... A fish. Okay, she's more than a fish. She's the best fish! For those who haven't heard me gushing over her before, Mifa is one of the champions of Hyrule, representing the Zora race. She and Link were childhood friends, but it was clear she had a thing for our hero in green. Unfortunately. 
she never got the chance to tell him. Why must the good die young? She was top of the class for my top 15 healers, as well as high on my favorite characters list. So what makes her equally qualified for the number one spot here? To start with the obvious, she's a total cutie. Come on, the shy, gentle, caring character is a popular archetype for a reason. Not only that, but as you've seen, I'm a sucker for the childhood friends blossoming into lovers trope. It makes the connection run that much deeper than your normal love at first sight story. Her voice is also lovely. It perfectly reflects her gentle personality. Adding to it, her design is pretty easy on the eyes. Slender and elegant with a red and white color scheme to match, which I'm a sucker for. Red's my favorite color. Can't you tell? Also, don't mistake her gentle, caring nature as a sign of weakness. She is not timid in the least and is more than willing to put her life on the line for her home and loved ones. She is insanely powerful in Age of Calamity, and her ability in Breath of the Wild, Mipha's Grace, has been a lifesaver. It's hard to hate a gal that is able to handle herself and saves your hiney when you do a dumb. Oh, and remember the part about her dying? Yeah! That never stops her as she can heal you from beyond the grave. But what really puts her over the top? I love the whole tragedy of the romance with her and Link. She made the Zora equivalent of a wedding ring and was this close to popping the question. But she had to put her feelings aside and now it's too late for her. What makes this especially sad is that her species can live up to a thousand years old, and she was probably 50 in human years, so she didn't even get to live half her natural lifespan. Not to mention, her society didn't approve of her and Link's relationship, so there was an enticing forbidden love thing between them. Even though they were super cute together and good for each other, we could have seen a plaza, but we were robbed! Robbed, you hear? Why couldn't Nintendo just let the beautiful fish woman be happy? She deserved to be happy, dang it! Why can't we have all some things? He's the fiery joker. These were his crushes. But remember who won in the end, ladies. Cut! Hey everyone, this is Josh. If you like this video, please like, subscribe, leave a comment, and share the video around. Please check out my other social media like my Twitter, Twitch, and Tumblr. Check out my other channels such as Joshua Burner for reactions and other stuff, Dragon Fighter Gaming for Tabletop, and Pop Equestria for cartoons. Consider checking below the video and donating to my Patreon, Streamlabs for my merchandise, or becoming a YouTube member. Thanks for watching. <laughs>